right, so hello everyone. Um, very excited to be here and I'd like to talk to all of you about structured streaming in Apache Spark. So quick intro on who I am. I'm a software engineer at Databricks. Work on the streaming team and our team motto is we make your streams come true. Um, I'm a Spark committer and um, I'd like to know you better as well. So I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, so who has heard of Apache Spark right now? Could you raise your hand? Okay, great. Who is using Spark for ETL right now? Okay, great. Um, who has heard of structured streaming? Okay, so 50%. And um, who is using structured streaming right now? Great, thank you, awesome. All right, so I'd like to get all of you to start using structured streaming because it's super cool, and I'm gonna show you why. So about Databricks, we're the team that started the Spark project back in UC Berkeley. Now it's Apache Spark. Um, our mission is to make big data simple, and we have our unified analytics platform as our product where, we, where you can run managed Spark clusters on the cloud and run your codes on notebook interfaces. All right. So talking about streaming, building robust stream processing is hard. That's like a no-brainer. There are a lot of complexities involved. One of them, you have complex data. You have data stored in many different silos and many different data formats. So you can have you know, like some you know, bucket containing JSON files, some bucket containing CSV files. You want to combine all of those. In addition, data can be dirty, it'll generally be dirty, and it could be late, it could be out of order. You have very complex workloads. Now with big data, we're trying to build these very complex continuous pipelines where we're combining streaming with interactive queries where we want to create dashboards, where we want to train our machine learning models on like the latest data. And at the same time, we're dealing with very complex systems where we have very diverse storage systems. You have databases, you have Kafka, you have S3 or Kinesis. Some are eventually consistent. Some provide ordered data. Some provide data, but no ordering guarantees. And you're working with distributed systems, so you have to deal with like system failures as well and how to deal with these you know, like expected failures. So with structured streaming, what we wanted to do was at least simplify some of these problems. Um, one of these is like, first of all, structured streaming is built on top of the Spark SQL engine. So you get the fast, scalable, fault tolerant, you know, Spark workloads that you love and use. And it's built on top of the data frame and data set API. So it, we have these higher level APIs that you're used to from um, pandas or from R where you're using data frames and data sets where you can deal with complex data and complex workloads and you can do all kinds of crazy transformations on your data. And what's the best part of Spark is that it has a very rich ecosystem of data sources. You can integrate with many storage systems just out of the box natively. So with structured streaming, what we wanted to do was you should not have to reason about streaming itself. You should just write your simple queries and Spark should continuously update the results for you. So what we're dealing with is from this concept of tables, we're going to the concept of unbounded tables, infinite tables. So let's quickly take a high level look into a streaming query with a streaming work count example. So first of all, your stream has a source. So the source, you specify one or more locations to read from. In this example, we've specified Kafka as a source. We have built-in support for files on HDFS, S3. Um, and then you can read from Socket, or you can plug in anything you want. You can plug in Cassandra using the Spark Cassandra connector. And once you have your sources, you can include multiple sources by unioning your data frames. Then you do your transformations. This is your business logic. So you used to do this in batch. So you just do your group by and count. And then Catalyst, Spark SQL's underlying engine, 
will figure out how to execute these transformations incrementally. And then the internal processing will be always exactly once. So Spark automatically streamifies your queries when you write a data frame or data set query using Scala, Python, Java, R, or even SQL. What we do is we get this logical plan. This is your intermediate representation. Then we optimize it into a physical Spark plan which actually executes on the underlying RDDs. And what Catalyst does is it just incrementalizes these uh, physical plans over time. So you get new data in, you get new data out. So once you have your business logic, you have to output it to a sync. You may have multiple sources for your streaming query, but you can only have one sync. You can basically write it out to several different syncs at the same time, but that'll mean you'll have different queries. So the syncs accept the output of each batch or trigger in structure streaming, and the, when supported syncs are transactional, for example, the file sync by itself is transactional, you get exactly once guarantees end to end. And we have another way to, you can use a for each writer where you can write your arbitrary outputting logic. You can write your arbitrary sync to output data to anywhere you want, even like alerting pager duty, for example. Then you have your output mode. So what are output modes? This is basically what's output to the sync at every trigger. So you could have a complete output mode, which outputs the whole answer every time. What does this mean? This means that if you were to not run a streaming query, but you had all of your data in batch, you wrote a batch job, and then you executed it, you got the full output. Once you streamify this, and you're in complete mode, you're gonna get the same output once you run through all of your data. Update mode basically outputs changed rows for like primary keys. This is generally done in aggregations where you have some grouping keys and then you're outputting the updated partial results to your sync every time. And then the default is the append mode where you're outputting new rows only. And the deal with append mode is that in append mode you cannot rescind your output. So if you're doing like an aggregation and you want to do it in append mode, what this means is that you can now output the results unless you're sure that it's never ever going to change. And this generally means that you have some like time-based data and you're dealing with time and then you need to make sure that, okay, now late data is not going to arrive so this result is final, so I'm outputting the final result. The trigger is when to output your data. It's specified currently as a time. It'll eventually support data sizes, so you can buffer data up to some point and then run a trigger. If you don't specify a trigger, it means as fast as possible, run as fast as possible. And um, we also have a run once trigger, which basically means run my query for just one trigger and stop it. So here, you can actually do the scheduling yourself if you want to leverage structured streaming, but run batch jobs of hours, for example, if you're not continuously getting data, but you're getting data once a day or one, you know, like once an hour. Then you also have to specify a checkpoint location which tracks the progress of your streaming query in persistent storage. This is what provides us with fault tolerance. And ca it can be used to restart the query if there are failures. Beforehand, with old Spark streaming, you used to specify a checkpoint directory, but when you upgraded your Spark version, it might not have worked. With structured streaming, we fixed that, so you can upgrade your Spark versions and still get your streaming working from where you left off. And then you call start to start your streaming query. So as I mentioned, we provide fault tolerance through our checkpointing. Our offsets of what's processed is saved as JSON into a write-ahead log on your persistent storage. And you can resume after you change your streaming transformations. Which and this 
system provides us end-to-end -end exactly once guarantees. So let's talk about a little bit more about com complex streaming ETL. So traditional ETL, what you do is you have some data coming in. Within seconds, you're dumping it to files, and then since these files are small, you want to batch them up over time. So you wait hours, and then you write it out to some table, and then your data is available for your dashboards in like hours. And um, this is kind of a problem when you want low latency. It's basically you have hours of delay before taking a decision on your latest data. And if you want to do s critical things like intrusion detection or anomaly detection, this is just too late and it's un unacceptable. So with structured streaming, you can process your raw data as soon as it's available and output it to your table and it'll be ready for querying. So let's walk off an example. So we're receiving some JSON data in Apache Kafka. We're gonna parse the nested JSON data that we're receiving from Kafka. We're gonna flatten it, and then we're gonna store it in a parquet table. We're gonna get end to end exactly once guarantees, and we're gonna get a very nice you know, parquet table that can be queried uh, very quickly with Spark. So this is basically all it takes. You first start off by specifying your Kafka source. Then the second block does your transformation logic. Um, your value was a, you, the value you get off of Kafka was a string, you turn it into JSON. You provide the schema, and then you basically, the UDF transforms your JSON data into structured data. And then you just write it out. And you can basically rewrite, remove all the vowels and you know, put parentheses or forward slashes and this is basically what Python would look like at the same time. So reading from Kafka, how do you do it? This is support natively in Spark. You first provide your list of brokers as a comma delimited list. Then you provide us what to read. You provide, you know, like, hey, subscribe to these comma separated list of topics or subscribe to this pattern of topics or you can use assign to read specific partitions in your topics. And then you also can give us where to start from. Do you want to start from the latest, the tip of the stream? Do you want to start from what's earliestly available in Kafka or do you want to start from a specific uh, offsets? And like this providing specific offsets is generally very helpful if you're like, uh, migrating your workload to a different um, data format or different location. So the raw data, data set contains these columns. You have your key, which is in binary. You have your values, which is in binary, provided from Kafka. You have your topics. You have your, which partition it's coming from. You have the offsets, and you have the timestamps of when it was ingested into Kafka. Then you can turn your binary value to a string. Let's call it JSON here. And then we use, parse the JSON string using the from JSON UDF, and we're calling it data. And you can see how the JSON string suddenly turns into this nested data column type, which contains our schema. Then we flatten out the nested column, and then you have your fully, full schema out there. So all of this, we have powerful built-in APIs and UDFs to perform very complex data transformations. Moving from JSON to JSON, you can use explodes. We have like basically hundreds of functions and you can check our blog post on some very common data transformation applications. So once you've done your transformations, you want to write it out to some file sync or another sync. We like Parquet a lot, and uh, Spark supports Parquet natively. Basically, what you might want to do is partition it by date, for example, just so that you can query, um, basically providing date when you have event time in your data is like very useful, so that you can prune out like 90% of your data when you're actually doing queries in the end. And Parquet, since it's a columnar storage, you only read the columns that you're interested in, so you get super you know, high performance. 
then you enable checkpointing by providing the checkpoint location option to provide the place where you save the offset logs. And then start starts your streaming query. And basically what this does is that it gives you a handle to your streaming query. And you can use this handle to look for the recent progress, latest progress of your stream, how many records it processed, how, many, how much state is in your aggregation. And you can also use it to stop it or throw an exception if the underlying stream fails with await termination. And what this provides is, in the end, you get data consistency on ad hoc queries with structured streaming within seconds. And the thing here, the most important thing here, which most other systems don't have, is that the parquet table is updated atomically and ensures prefix integrity. What this means is that if you were writing some files out, then your Spark cluster died or your node died, something died, and then you have some partial garbage left out, written out. Normally, you know, if you query that data set, you know, you would see this garbage data and it's not nice. But with structured streaming and the file sync, you either see all the updates or nothing at all. So partial results don't show up. And this is very helpful in making sure you have a robust ETL pipeline. We have, we love Kafka, so we have a lot of support that we added in Spark 2.2, where you can actually write out to Kafka as well when you read from it. So you can do your aggregations and write it out to other topics. And your data frame must have a value field. It could be string, it could be binary. The, if you don't provide a key field, we'll use a null so that it'll be randomly partitioned. And what you can also do is you can also run batch queries on Kafka as well, which makes Kafka a very powerful storage platform. So notice how here we're not actually calling read stream, we're actually calling read, and this will make the data in Kafka available as a batch data frame. And you can use this just to make sure that if you have any problems with your data, this just makes it super easy to debug what's going on with your data. And we have support for Kinesis in Databricks Runtime in our Databricks platform. Um, basically, similarly, you provide a region of where your Kinesis stream is. You provide a comma-separated list of stream names, and then you also provide an initial position, and it gives you a very similar schema to your Kafka schema, and then you can do whatever you want with it. So. If you're dealing with streaming, you want to work with, generally work with time. So event time support was one of the biggest things lacking in old Spark streaming with D streams. You might, what people want to do now is you want to, you, you might want to aggregate statistics by event time, and you want to handle the cases where event, events can arrive late or out of order. So windowing, for example, on event time is just another type of grouping in structured streaming. It's basically another UDF. Here we have our timestamp column. We're grouping it into windows of one hour. This is a tumbling window, so windows of one hour, one hour, one hour. If you add one more parameter, you make it a sliding window. And then if you add one more parameter, you can provide a start offset, so if you want to create windows of hours, but you know, start it off at 15 minutes past the hour. If you want to do something more interesting, if you want to group by your device, for example, the, that's generating your IoT data, you just add that to your group by statement, and then you have your aggregation. And then you can calculate your average signal. And we do support UDAFs, so user-defined aggregate functions. You can write arbitrary logic um, to do all these crazy things. So stateful processing in a distributed system is pretty hard. And um, the way we provide fault tolerance in these cases is through storing a distributed state in between triggers. So 
each trigger, you read your previous state, you combine it with your current state for that trigger, and then you write your updated state at the end of the trigger. And this way, if you, if you stop your stream and restart, you can pick off from your left off state. The state is generally stored in memory, but it's backed by a write-ahead log that's writing to HDFS or S3, and this provides fault-tolerant exactly once guarantees. And structured streaming automatically handles late, late data, and what we do is we keep old state around for old windows of data, for example, just to be able to handle these late data. But you, you notice, I mean, if you're gonna keep late old state around, then this state could grow indefinitely, unboundedly, and you know, when's it gonna stop? So how's it gonna scale? You have that problem. So we solve that problem through watermarking, where the watermark is basically a moving threshold of how late data is, you know, like how late data can be given your expectations and when you can actually drop old state and say, okay, this result's never gonna change from now on. It trails behind the max scene event time, and the trailing gap is configurable. It's totally up to you. It totally depends on your system and your know, data producers. And how it works is as follows. So data newer than the watermark may be late, but we allow it to aggregate. Data older than the watermark is too late and it's dropped. So because we're dropping all those late records, that key is never gonna be updated again. So we can actually automatically also delete the state for that key to limit the number of intermediate state kept in memory. The watermark is use, useful only in stateful aggregations and stateful operations, such as aggregations, uh, calling distincts or like dropping duplicates, and um, some advanced operations like map groups with state. It is ignored in non-stateful streaming queries and batch queries, but if you do provide your watermark, we still track the statistics, so you can also, in your ETL pipeline, see how, you know, the statistics of your event time while your append-only ETL uh, job is running. And you provide it with the with watermark API. You provide your event time column and then you provide a delay key. For example, here, 10 minutes. So walking off an example, you can see we have three records coming in in this trigger. The x-axis is the processing time, the y-axis is the event time. And what we said is we've used a watermark of 10 minutes. So also notice that how you know, the event time 1214 around, arrived at like 1212. You could have clock skew, you could have things coming from the future. So that's something you need to take into consideration when you're setting the watermark. So the system tracks the max observed event time, and based on that max event time, we subtract the delay key and we set a watermark. Then once we receive new records, we still increase the max by the yellow line. The red records arrived late, but we still consider them in our aggregation. And the record below is basically too late and it's ignored in our processing. And it's, the state is dropped. You can read more about it in this blog post once the slides are out. So what this provides is a very clean separation of con concerns where you're separating the query semantics from the processing details, your business logic. So we have several time-related things here. Your query semantics is how do I group my data by time? You use that in your window function. For example, this is used both in batch and streaming. And we've set five minutes here. The processing details, how late can my data be? You provide that with your with watermark function. And then how often do I wanna emit results? That's your trigger. So you specify that here, for example, with 10 seconds. 
With Spark 2.2, we support arbitrary stateful operations. Um, the method for this is called map groups with state. It applies any user-defined stateful function to a user-defined state. Basically, you give us a grouping key, we provide you all the values received for that grouping key, and we provide you a state that you can update or use during your function. And what you output from this function is what's emitted to the sync or downstream. It's supported in Scala and Java, and um, it supports per key timeouts both in event time or processing time. Other interesting operations that you might want to do is, for example, deduplication. So you use that with drop duplicates. And watermark, the watermark allows you to basically limit the state. The first time you receive a result for this key, you will output the result. Every time you get it again, you'll just ignore it. And once the watermark passes, we'll just drop it from the state. And then if we receive the same record again, we just drop it from the input as well. You can do stream back joins, of course, from streaming data frames to batch data frames using the join function. And you can also do stream stream joins. Uh, you can use map groups with state or flat map groups with state to write your arbitrary joining logic. But direct support using the join function is coming with Spark 2.3. In fact, we have just merged um, inner equi joins with time ranges uh, in Spark. It's available in the master. So since this is a data engineering conference, I just want to talk about a little bit about the ETL that we do at Databricks, since I think it's going to be very relevant to all of you. So I'd like to first explain you the evolution of our data pipeline. This is nothing special. This is basically what everyone builds. Um, but I'd just like you to tell my story of how we built it at Databricks while I was on the data engineering team. So we had events going into Kafka. Um, in our case, we also used Kinesis. And what we wanted in the end was to have some streaming analytics to do some alerting and you know, uh, monitoring. And we also want to track you know, the historical views of you know, like how our customers are using our platform, or how our services are behaving over time. So we use structured streaming, Apache Spark, to run our streaming analytics. This is great. But Kafka only stores your data for one day or seven day or how long you configure it. So you can't query historical results. So how do you get historical queries? Well, it's the same data frame API. So it's kind of simple, I guess. You can use the Lambda architecture, you know, every day you can run a batch job that just dumps all the data into S3 or into your data lake. And okay, you got your Lambda architecture set. But what do you want to do next? Uh, from this data lake, you can power your reporting, which is great. But now the challenge number two is messy data. So you have dirty data coming in. Okay, we're going to use Spark to validate our results. I mean, we have to do it on both the streaming side and both the batch side. It's kind of, you know, like, there's some work put into it, but it's the same APIs. Okay, it's kind of easy. So we do it. But then, once you do the validation, it's kind of too late. You've already written out your data to your data lake. So you want to fix your mistakes and failures. So how do you do that? So, okay, you know, like, let's say I run my batch job once a day, so I partition my data by date, so every day I can actually overwrite whatever is in my data lake. So if there are any mistakes or if there are any failures, I can just overwrite all the data. And, like, failures are, like, you know, your EC2 instance getting spot killed, so you wrote out some partial files. You need to clean all that stuff up with your batch stuff, and you need to do all this reprocessing on your data lake. So, okay, we have step three. And then, you know, like our data scientists come and say, this, you know, like data lake, querying this table sucks. It's just too slow. And then you look into why that is, 
And then you see, oh, there are like so many small files that I was reading from the stream. So, you know, if you want to make the latest data available, um, you have to put out small files. Then you're going to do, you know, like you're going to compact these small files into large, you know, one gigabyte parquet files, which will give you the optimal performance. So you're going to run a compaction job. But, oh no, what happened? You know, while I was doing the compaction job, you know, my reporting jobs failed because of file not found exceptions, because I just deleted the files while the other job was using them. Crap. So, okay, we have to schedule these, you know, like the compaction jobs at 2 a.m. at night since while no one's looking at, you know, the reports. So what I want to introduce is a solution to all of this with Databricks Delta. Basically, we wanted to solve all these problems, make it super simple. And we believe we've built the first unified data management system that delivers the scale of a data lake, the reliability and performance of a data warehouse, and the low latency of streaming. And how do we do that? So Databricks Delta provides you the good of Delta Lakes by providing massive scale on Amazon S3. It uses open formats like Parquet or ORC, so you're not locked in. You can always move your data out and use it with another system. And it allows you know, um, advanced applications like running machine learning or real-time applications. It provides you the good of data warehouses where you have pristine high-quality data. You have transactional reliability, and you get fast queries of 10 to 100x, which you normally don't get on data lakes. So this enables a whole new set of app complex applications. So how does it work under the hood? It provides the massive scale by decoupling compute and storage. So you can use as much compute as you want. The storage, it's S3, it's managed. You don't care about it. It provides reliability through asset transactions and data validation. So this is one of the biggest problems when working with data lakes that you don't get these asset transactions. You get high performance through data indexing and caching, where we've observed you know, running queries on like petabyte scale data to run 100x faster. And you also enable real-time streaming ingest and provide low latency uh, to downstream applications. So you take this canonical data pipeline and what you transform it into is the Delta architecture. Basically reading from Kafka or data lake, using structured streaming, writing out to Databricks Delta. And once you write it out to Databricks Delta, you can still use uh, streaming or batch jobs to run your streaming analytics and your reports. And you get all of this with the best of the data lakes, the scale of data lakes, you get the reliability through transactions, you get performance through caching and indexing, and you get low latency with structured streaming. We use Delta at Databricks heavily. Um, we process about 14, more than 14 billion records an, an hour with like 10 nodes. And we meet diverse latency requirements as efficiently as possible when it ranges from seconds to minutes. And kind of the architecture that we have is basically as follows. What we have is we first read our data. We write, you know, like raw tables, which, you know, like we don't do a lot of processing on them. We do the data cleaning that we want. We put it in the format that we want. And then we write it out first. And then we split it up into many summary tables, where these summary tables are also updated by streaming jobs and you get compaction and all that stuff so that you can query these summary tables which are pretty small very efficiently. And these summary tables are actually what power our analytics or reporting tools. And the thing here is basically raw tables are huge in size. We have tables over like hundreds of terabytes. Um, the summary tables are tens of gigabytes or hundred, hundreds of gigabytes. And what we do is we also 
the raw tables, you know, their value decreases over time. So we drop, you know, data that's older than seven days, for example. You know, Kafka keeps things inside for one day, or Kinesis keeps it in one day. The raw tables keep it in for seven days. So if you messed up something, you can always go back and do your backfill for like the full seven days of data. And the, basically the whole retention is totally up to you. You drop when you want to. And then the summary tables, we keep them around for longer because they're very useful, they're small, and um, we don't need to you know, throw them away as much because they're pretty valuable. So for more info on all of this, we, you can check out the Structure Streaming Programming Guide. Um, on the Apache website. You can read, we have a huge list of Databricks blog posts for more focused discussions. Um, we have an anthology of technical assets on structured streaming which contains tens of blog posts on advanced usage of structured streaming. And follow our blog posts so to see more and more uh, information on structured streaming. And try out Apache Spark and Databricks Unified Analytics pro platform that provides notebooks to create a collaborative uh, workspace. We have a free version, the Community Edition, which you can try out today. And Databricks Runtime 3.4 is coming out. Um, Databricks Runtime is an optimized version of Apache Spark, optimized for the cloud, has many caching and optimization layers, and provides enterprise security tools. And we are hiring, of course, um, very high growth. I'm also on the careers page, which is kind of flattering. Um, so check us out So if you want to work on all these cool tools and technologies. So thank you, and I can take questions if we have time. And um, I love Henry Kissinger's comment of, does anyone have any questions for my answers? So, happy to take them. Hey, um, when can we expect uh, integration of the uh, structured streaming with the Apache Beam? Apache Beam. That's, I mean, it's, I would think it was supported. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not active in Apache Beam. Um, depends on the open source community, I would say, or Google. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, this is another question about Apache Beam, but I, I want to put the onus on you to, uh, um, I mean, Beam is uh, uh, doing a lot of work on establishing the semantics of streaming queries. Mm -hmm. uh, like they've defined watermark kind of differently than you've defined it. Mm -hmm. um, Flink has streaming SQL. Um, what efforts are you making uh, to try and harmonize what you're producing with what other people are producing? Because mm -hmm. the last thing the you know the community wants is divergent implementations of SQL, and mm -hmm. you you claim you're making it simple, but the semantics of SQL and especially streaming SQL is incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. So the kind of the details of this stuff really matters. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so on that point, well, Apache Beam is providing a higher level API over um, you know, Spark, Flink, and Dataflow. And what it is trying to provide is this API that combines all of these together. So if these systems work differently and have different APIs, I mean, it's, it, it's pretty much a wrapper around all. Yeah. That's, they're defining the semantics as well. Mm-hmm, I see. I mean, we can talk about this more offline. I don't have too much context on the semantics of Beam, unfortunately, so. Um, 